All Saints Day technically is November 1st on Friday, but customarily we observe All Saints Day the Sunday beforehand, and so really glad that y'all can be here for this special service. Um, I'm going to invite you to take out your In the Life of the Church insert, and while you are doing that, good morning to all of you joining us on Facebook, and we hope you are having a magnificent morning where you are as well. We are really glad that you were joining us with us, joining with us this morning. Um, okay, several lots of things coming up in the life of the church. We can't cover everything, but just a couple of things to point out. Uh, first, I don't know that it's in here. Oh, we, yeah, we do have our trunk or treat this afternoon at four o'clock. So families, bring your kids back. The rest of you, bring a car, decorate it, and give away candy. It will be lots of fun, four o'clock today. Uh, coming up on Saturday, our deacons have a team that are going to be running the, um, the, the Matthew 25 Ministries Hunger 5K. And among that team, running is a euphemism for walking with style. So um, I do hope you, you can join us for that. Uh, yeah, I did it last year and had, just had a blast. So um, you know, my walking partner, Lynn, you're on, right? All right, on. So, um, so uh, just sign up if you, if you have questions, touch base with Larry Lewis, um, you know, let us know that you're going to be there, and we'll tr try to look for one another and connect the day of. It is a lot of fun. And then to take note on the inside, we've got a number of new Bible study opportunities that are starting up. So we've got the, uh, the Most Extraordinary Life group that's meeting on Wednesdays. We've got the Letters of Paul meeting on Thursdays. We've got a Women's Abide group on Monday mornings, a number of new opportunities you're interested, just mark the connect card, and, uh, and we will try to connect you with those particular opportunities. Or you can just reach out to the leaders directly yourself. Um, okay, one other thing to pass on. Uh, uh, Todd Powers, the chair of our personnel committee, has just asked for a little bit of time here at the start of worship. I'm afraid you're going to have to go up there because I don't have a nifty lapel mic for you. Um, so... I'm just going to cede the time, and I'll be back to introduce our reflective time in just a moment. Doug. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to take just a moment to say a few words of appreciation to our three wonderful pastors. <laughs> Russell, Stephen, and Morris, you are a true blessing to this congregation. Your commitment to us has been unwavering. Your selfless service has impacted many lives here, including mine. You are teachers, you are counselors, and disciples, providing a living example of how to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. On behalf of the congregation, let me express our deepest gratitude to each of you. We are truly blessed to have you. God, God bless you and continue to bless your ministry. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you so much. It is really a joy and a delight to be a part of this family. It's a joy and a delight to work with such great colleagues. Uh, God is good. And, and I'm just having a lot of fun being a part of this family of faith. So thank you, Todd. Thank you to all of you for your encouragement. Um, but we're here to worship. We're not here to talk about pastors. We're here to worship. We're here to turn our hearts and minds to Jesus. We're here to bask in his goodness and his grace and his glory. Today, on this commemoration of All Saints Day, we're here also to be renewed in the hope, of the resurrection, and the life everlasting that we're on a journey, we're on a journey home. And so I'm gonna invite you to take just a few moments, we're gonna take our customary 60 seconds of time here, and I'm gonna invite you to connect with the Lord. Um, we all come with lots of things going on in our brain, and this is a time where we can lay down those things, and focus our hearts and minds on the one we have come to meet with today. Let's focus our hearts and minds on Jesus. Let's take 60 seconds and prepare to hear from the Lord today.
picture all the saints gathered around the throne. And I, all they're doing is just praising God, Yahweh, Yahweh, over and over again. That's the sound of the saints. And we have an opportunity now to honor them today. And let's start by doing that by standing and singing our first two songs. The first one is The Sound of the Saints. Please join me. Oh, I love to hear the song of creation. The wind and the rhythm of the rain. Oh, the thunder it speaks of your power. But there's something in the sound of the saints. I've been washed in the roar of the ocean. The peace in the echo. Forever flowing by the throne of 
go. There we reach the sign God, yes, we do gather with the saints from all times in your kingdom. We gather and give thanks for all that you have done for us, that have made it possible for to, to come to your throne, because Jesus opened the gates to the Holy of Holies. Lord, we, we gather and are reminded that in our world there is, there is hatred, there is unrest, there is almost no trust. Help us be united in your love and serving you, that we can share your light and your love to those around us. May we be a community of faith and make a difference in our world, in our community, and in our families' lives. We pray these many things, giving you thanks. In Christ's name, amen. So we come to God, the one who calls us to repent he hears us. So let us, in trusting our Creator, let us gather before Him, confessing our sins, knowing that He is willing, ready, and able to forgive. Shall we pray? Eternal God, in every age you have raised up men and women to live and die in faith. We confess that we are indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name but we are silent. You call us to do what is just, but we remain idle. You call us to live faithfully, but we are afraid. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow your way, that joined with those from ages past who have served you with faith, hope, and love, we may inherit the kingdom you promised in Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, here to believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Be reconciled to God and to one another in his name. Amen. And as we are reconciled to God, we can willingly and freely come to, into God's presence. So at this time, let us share the, the, our, God's tithes and our offerings in thanksgiving for all that he has done for us. Let us bring our gifts in thanksgiving.
Oh, holy God, receive these gifts for the work of your church. And we ask that you would bless them and multiply these gifts, that they might touch many people, that they may be used to proclaim your glory around the world and here locally at home, and that others might know the power of your forgiving love. We dedicate these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. As before we're seated, we are all the family of God, whether here in the sanctuary or around the world, and we especially greet those who are joining us on Facebook. May the peace of Christ be with you this day and always. May us, we greet one another, sharing his peace and his love. Hi, dear. Hi, good morning, sweetheart. The Lord bless you. Roger Hattersheimer's not on there. So now we come to the time, now we come to the time of the service where we are remembering our, the saints who have gone before us on this Sunday where we commemorate All Saints Day. Um, and so we have candles on the table. We've been collecting names all throughout the month. We have the names of the members who have passed away. Uh, but also, you have been submitting names of loved ones and friends uh, who are part of our extended family of faith. And so as the name is called, Stephen and I are going to alternate reading the names. We do invite family members to come to light a taper off the Christ candle here in the center and then light a memorial candle in remembrance of the loved one that is being named. If there's not a family member here, if there's someone uh, who's a friend to the family or special to that family. Uh, Pastor Mitchell will be here to assist anyone that's needing a little uh, help with that. And of course, if no one's able, to, present and able to come forward, Pastor Mitchell will be lighting a candle in, in their memory as well. Um, and then Pastor Iyer will lead us in a pastoral prayer, which will lead into some time of silent reflection and remembrance. And during that time, I invite you to remember the blessings that the saints have conferred upon us. You know, whether we're remembering um, someone by name that's important in your life or you, if that name hasn't been submitted, just go ahead and remember them and remember the blessing that God worked in your life through them. And then after a time of silence, Roy will conclude that with a, a reflection, a trumpet reflection, amazing grace, reminding us that when that we're all on our journey home. And that when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. And then finally, Stephen will lead us in the litany of gratitude. So with that being our purpose for this section of the service, let us begin. First name I mention is someone who is dear, dear to so many of us and who served as an administrative assistant for so many years, Vita Blevins.
Continuing our list, Mary Frances Quartz. Barb Hedesheimer. Sharon Stengel. Marilyn Whedon. Elaine Dickman. James Mulford. Robert Westermeyer. Ed Schwagerman. John Morrison. Carol Lee. Paul Freeland. William Powers, Jr. Wayne Leeper. Julian Drennan. And Isaiah Riley. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, our great and loving creator, we thank you that you care for us. We thank you that you sent Jesus to rescue us from death and from darkness and from evil. We thank you for the promise of Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
And we thank you, Lord, for the comfort that comes from the knowledge of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, that he has defeated death. The third day he rose again, that you've raised him to your right hand where he's seated right now and where he rules in all eternity and he rules in our lives. We thank you too, Lord Jesus, that you sent the Holy Spirit to be with us, to be our comforter and to care for us. And Lord, we pray for all of us who have lost loved ones that this year and in years past, we all know the pain of loss and of grief. And we pray now for that comforting Holy Spirit in this place, right now, in the quiet of this sanctuary, to be a place and a person of comfort to our hurting hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you too grieve with us. Jesus, when you stood at the tomb of your friend Lazarus, you cried. Thank you that you hurt with us, that you have compassion, that you feel for us in our lives. And may we know that, may all of us in this sanctuary, in this place, by faith, know that right now. We open our hearts to you. Lean back now, brothers and sisters, into the arms of the Lord, for he's here, and he embraces you, and he loves you. Join me, please, in the litany of gratitude that's printed in your worship guide. Lord, we gratefully remember these saints. People to encourage, to strengthen, to heal, to lead, to comfort, and to love. May their witness of faith encourage us. We take inspiration from the letter to the Hebrews, which says, therefore, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders. And let us run with perseverance the race that is marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Acts, and I'll be reading th uh, from chapter 20, verses 17 through 38. Hear the word of the Lord. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you, 
from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the world or to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine has supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. This is the word of the Lord. And may God add his blessing to the reading, to the teaching of his word. Amen. Okay, so we are wrapping up this three-part series that we've been doing, talking about the meaning of membership. And we've been framing membership through this phrase that I am called to follow Jesus as part of this community for this season of my life. And we zeroed in on that first week, just that it all hinges on the calling to follow Jesus. That's what Christianity is about, the calling to follow the carpenter from Galilee, the calling to follow the prophet Jesus Christ, the calling to follow the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, calling to follow him. But then we saw that as part of this community. And we were talking about that, you know, defining it as this people, this body, you know, that, that God's called. There, there aren't Lone Ranger Christians. We're called to be a part of a particular community. And we close this with, intriguingly, on All Saints Day for this season of my life. Um, we all know we go through times and seasons of life. Everybody thinks about that little passage from Ecclesiastes, you know, memorialized wonderfully by the birds, to everything turn 
You're not with me, okay. Yeah. There is a season turn to, you know, there, there's times and seasons of life. We as human beings long for permanence, and yet we live in a world of continual change. We live in a world where there are seasons of life. And we've talked about this before, that the idea of we run into a new season of life and part of the, the transition from one season to the next is that acknowledging the gifts, thanking God for the gifts, but also mourning. We mourn the season that has passed so that we can embrace the season that is ahead. So as I wrestled with this topic of the seasons of life, uh, you know, I was praying over this. as like, hey, you know, where do you find this in Scripture? And God brought me here to Acts 20. And to, it's an obscure little passage. Um, just in the context, remember Acts uh, Luke, the, the author of the gospel, this is his sequel, and, uh, and he is telling the story of the early church. A lot of it is about Paul, and he's spent, Luke traveled with Paul, most scholars are certain of this, and, and you know, the previous 10 or 12 or 15 or so chapters, Luke has been going in, in exhaustive detail into Paul's missionary journeys. And Paul has been traveling around the Mediterranean. Uh, you know, he spent a lot of time in Asia Minor where Ephesus was and, and Miletus. And, 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 and then he moves over. You, know, you remember that dramatic call where he gets the nighttime vision of the angel, come on over to Europe and, and help us. And he goes to Greece and he travels around in Greece. And, and in my mind, the way I envision that season of Paul's life of immense activity of, of a lot of bustle, and, and he's going from place to place. Some places he spends a few years. Some places um, he spends a, a shorter amount of time. He's encouraging, he's birthing new churches. He's encouraging communities of believers that have already been there. And, and we see his letters. You know, you know, some of his letters have been preserved for us, and the church acknowledges them as inspired by the Holy Spirit and, and, and useful for teaching and correcting and rebuking and training in righteousness. They're part of Scripture. I'm certain Paul probably wrote other letters. And, and in my mind, I'm envisioning letters just going back and forth and re him receiving vid visitors from different churches and, and this, this hub of activity that is all around Paul, all during this time and season of life. I can only imagine it was an exciting time for, for him. But then we see that he's going into a new season of life. Take a look at verses 22 and 23. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. And so in that, I hear he's recognizing there is a new season of life that I am embarking unto. And some key things in that that I see, one, compelled by the Holy Spirit. This is, you know, he, he is being led by the Spirit. This is not him running away from something. It is him being called to something. I think that's, that's an important thing for us to remember in seasons of life. You know, sometimes seasons of life are just thrust on us by circumstances. It's time to retire. It's time to graduate. You know, we've... We've had to bury a loved one. We've had to say goodbye. We are moving across country. Sometimes those seasons are thrust upon us, but sometimes those seasons are seasons that we discern. I'm looking for a new job. I'm ready for a new challenge, a new adventure. And in those situations, and I th here I think Paul gives us some, some good guidance, compelled by the Spirit. He's not running away from something. He's not pursuing the grass is always greener. Because we can always be tempted by, well, you know, I bet things are so much better over there. I guarantee you they're not. <laughs> the grass is always greener in any given context. There's this hard to define inner spiritual unction and the only analogy that I can give you is from my own life. Um, you know, that, you know, in my pastoral ministry, 
there were times where God gave me an openness to call, you know, an openness to another call. And I would explore that. Sometimes that exploration led back to, no, you're confirmed to stay here in this place where you are. Sometimes that openness, that move from the Holy Spirit was sending me back with a little renewed focus and vigor. But in the case that brought me here, it was completely different. The openness, I wasn't itching to get out of someplace, the openness led me to the next step and the next step and the next step and lo and behold, in a new call. And I suggest to you that's probably what's going on with Paul, this compelled by the Holy Spirit. I'm open to what's next. I do not know what will happen to me. All I know is I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem. It is interesting. I only know that the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. That's what, how we know it's not the grass is greener. He's feeling called. He's feeling called to this next step, go to Jerusalem. And he also feels trepidation. This ain't going to be easy. You see, I think that's important for us as well. Sometimes the calling is to a greater challenge. It's something that's going to test us and push us and strengthen us. He's simply following the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you're listening to God, if you're practicing those habits of daily abiding with the world, with the word of God, listen, cultivating your ability to listen to the Holy Spirit, to listen to that still, small voice, to be challenged by the word of God, to be strengthened. You'll hear it. You'll hear those words of challenge, those words of encouragement, those words of leading. Where is the Lord calling you? And there are times and seasons where he's calling us into a new season. Paul is demonstrating that for us here. And so, um, as he's traveling, he's traveling to Jerusalem, and, and he, you know, he's trying to make a beeline, but he's passing near Ephesus, and, and he wants to meet with the leaders of Ephesus, but he doesn't want to create a ruckus. If he shows back up there, you know, there, there was quite a ruckus, and you can read all about it, go back in Acts and, and read all about it, just, you know, it's all kinds of fun stuff happening there. Um, he doesn't want to cause a ruckus. And so he stops off at Miletus, and, and it's not far away. And so he just sends a message. Hey, could you come see me? Could you come see me? And, and I, again, I envision this being something for mutual encouragement. He planted this church. He had beloved friends that are there. He worked there for three years. And he tells some of the story about this. And so they come, they meet, and, and you know, in this part, uh, you know, verses 17 through 21, Paul's recounting his ministry there, how they shared together in ministry. So, so there, he's leaning on his friends and the shared stories of their times together. I should, you know, if I, if I can just make a momentary excursus, you know, the, the big idea there is Friendship, he's leaning on friends, there's sharing and shared ministry. I do just want to take note of that verse 19. Um, you know, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. And I just, conscience tells me, you know, in, in, yeah, this is not an anti Semitic statement. Uh, remember, Paul is Jewish, uh, he is ministering to, you know, he's trying to figure out how to minister to Jews and Gentiles. When he's talking about Jewish opponents, he's not them over there. He's saying, my brothers, you know, I've got some within my family that are opposing me. So this is not some kind of statement that it, it, it perhaps has been read and it interpreted in an anti-Semitic way. Don't go there, folks. Just don't go there. Remember, Jesus is Jewish. Uh, Paul is Jewish. All, all the early church, it's Jewish. They're trying to figure out from within the community what's going on there. So don't, don't make this some kind of other thing. And they, you know, just 
I got to always warn people off against that because anti-Semitism just keeps rearing its ugly head again and again and again and again and again. Um, but the emphasis on this is in the fellowship. The emphasis is on the friendship. The emphasis is on we served the Lord. I was with you in all this time. And I envision that in that conversation, there were sweet times of remembrance of shared ministry. Sweet times remembering what the Lord accomplished together through us. So again, as you're potentially facing a seasonal change, remembering. Remembering. Remembering how God worked in that season of life. Praising God for how God worked in that season of life. Rejoicing. Gratitude, I believe, is a key to a seasonal change, a seasonal transition. To go back. Gratitude is the key to so much. But going back with gratitude and remembering that which God has done. But then it's interesting, you know, if we skip down to verse 25, uh, then there's this word of challenge. Um, now I know that none of you among whom I've gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. So, you know, he knows season is changing. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. I don't know what's going on there. I need to do some more study on that. <laughs> you know, Paul, honestly, Paul sounds a little whiny to me in that, but, uh, you know, uh, that's not really the focus anyway. It gets into verse, uh, to tw verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has brought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw disciples away after them. So be on your guard. And, and so he delivers these words of exhortation, challenge. Encouragement. Now, we could get into the details of that another time. What I'm focusing on today, you know, these principles of seasonal transition, is he knows he's moving on, and he's trying to leave with his beloved a final word. A final word, in this case, of exhortation. Or a final word of encouragement. Or a final word of love. You wrap up the season with a bow, as it were, so that there is a sense of, I'm ready to move on. Gives you that sense. You know, we hear a lot of people talk about closure. What do you need? What do you need for closure? You know, when it's a season where it's the loss of a loved one, a funeral is a sense of closure. You're still processing afterwards, but you, know, you have that sense of closure that happens. If it's moving on from an, one job to another, some kind of processing, reflecting, and closing so that you can embrace the next season. I've been, over the years, I've been doing all kinds of interesting reading about you know, particularly the seasonal transitions of midlife crisis and retirement. Um, there's a wonderful book, Life Reimagined. I think it's Barbara Brown Taylor. I read it a, a, a few years ago. Um, and, and, and she, you know, she's talking about people, particularly at that retirement season. And, and she talks about this idea of, of she calls it reintegration that the people who hit that retirement season well, that what they do is they look back over everything that they have done, but then they repackage it, reintegrate it, and that is what then fuels them forward to, get this, she calls it their encore career. I like that, that's pretty cool. But, but you know, she says there's this really intentional process of looking back, reflecting, figuring out what did all that mean? And then moving forward into the encore career. And I suggest that's perhaps a little bit of the kind of thing. I'm not saying that's exactly what Paul's doing here. But he's been looking back and he says, you know, I got to have 
some parting words. Because these Ephesians, brothers and sisters, they're never going to see me again. What do they need to hear from me in this time? And so he leaves them with that. Um, and then, oh gosh, we get to verse 36. And this is, if, if you think cinematically, and you've been with me long enough, you know I think in movies. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm always thinking, what's the movie shot look like in this? When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. You know, and I, you know, I imagine that, you know, as they're, they're, they're praying, you know, I'm imagining it by the sea, seashore or at the docks, and, and they're praying, you know, and the sunset is coming down, and that it's, you know, rich, and, and probably what I would do cin cinematically is just, just have the swell of music over top of it so you don't hear the words, um, because we don't have the words here. He knelt down with all of them. He prayed, and they, and then they all wept and embraced, and that's where I would go to slow-mo. You know, they're kind of, oh, and um, they're, 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 they're weeping and embracing because it is such sweet, warm remembrances of their time together. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. And so we get this sense of heartfeltness. And I want that to be communicated in these transitions from times and seasons as well. I mean, that's kind of why we do this on All Saints Day. There's a heartfeltness. There's an earnest remembrance. A solemn remembrance. A lot of things of life are the matters of the heart. And earnestly and heartfeltly acknowledging this changing of the seasons. So we talk about times and seasons. Being called for this time and season of life. But any time we talk as Christians, as followers of Jesus, about times and seasons... We have to remember one other piece. And Paul nods in that direction in verse 24. Going back up, you know, he talks about compelled by the Spirit going to Jerusalem. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns that prisons and hardships are facing me. And then he says this, however, I consider my life nothing, worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And in that mental image of finishing the race, he says something, it's, it's, it's an image that's used across the New Testament. Um, when you finish the race, when you cross the finish line, you've come home. There's a place. And there's a crowd cheering for you. The author of Hebrews pictures this in beautiful ways. Uh, the book of Hebrews, in, in chapter 11, the author of Hebrews begins this long catalog of the heroes of faith, saying, by faith, Abraham lived, and by faith, Moses lived. And he goes through all the prophets, and it's this long catalog of the heroes of the faith who have gone before us, who suffered, and were looking forward to crossing the race, crossing the finish line, finishing the race, coming home to a celestial city that awaited them. They had their eyes fixed on that. And Paul then said, or we don't know if it's Paul. Actually, I think it's probably Apollos who wrote Hebrews, but that's neither here nor there. But then he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since we are surrounded by the saints who have gone before, since we are surrounded by all of those stretching all the way back who have gone before and lived their lives in faith, since we are surrounded by them, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The hope of the finish line, the hope of a home gives us strength to run the race that we have no matter what season of life we're in. And he goes on fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. For the joy set before him, 
for the hope of that home, for the joy, for the delight of the eternal enjoyment of the loving community with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and all the saints gathered in, for that joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. The hope that we will cross the finish line and be received with joy at home gives us strength to endure the trials, the difficulties, the pains, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as the melancholy Dane said in Shakespeare's Hamlet. The hope of a future home gives us strength no matter what season we're in today. Sometimes we go through hard seasons. We all go through hard seasons. The lie is that the hard season never ends. No season is permanent. We live in a world of change. But one day, one day we will cross that finish line. And let me tell you folks, all you got to do is run the race. This is one of those races where everybody who participates gets a trophy. That's grace. You run the race. You're not trying to beat somebody else out. If you cross the finish line, you win. And you come home. And you are received. Let me close with this illustration from one of my favorite singer-songwriters. When I was in my late teens and early 20s, I discovered a singer-songwriter named Darden Smith. You would never have heard of him. Uh, he's a Texas singer-songwriter, found him on a sampler tape. And I was just like, man, this guy's amazing. Picked up one of his early albums, and on that album uh, was a song. As a matter of fact, it's the title track to that early album, a song called Trouble No More. Not to be confused with the Allman Brothers song, Trouble No More. Also not to be confused with the Muddy Waters song, Trouble No More. Indeed, if you try to find the lyrics to this song, it's incredibly difficult to find. The best you're going to do, and I encourage you to do it, go online and you'll find a YouTube video from Darden Smith's Austin City Limits appearance sometime in the, sometime in the mid-90s and he's got ridiculously long hair, <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderfully 90s. But the song, and it, it's not a particularly Christian song. There's no mention of the gospel in it, and yet it says everything. Walk tall, my sisters and brothers, though the road is full of stones. Put one foot in front of the other. Do not fear to walk this road alone. Someday, when the journey is ended, you lie on the distant shore, and that day, when the burden is lifted, you won't. You won't have trouble no more. The melody is so simple. It's a simple song and simple lyric. But there will come a day when the race is run, when you've crossed the finish line, you are received home. There won't be trouble no more. The hope of that gives me hope for all the seasons of life. So I'm going to invite you to take a few moments. We're just going to sit still with the Lord. As always, I believe the Lord's been talking all through this service, through song, through remembrance, through story, through scripture, through sermon. What's the Lord been saying to you? What's one small thing, one small step that you're going to take on your journey home? Let's abide with the Lord.
let's stand together and sing our closing hymn for all the saints. Now, my friends, go in grace, go in mercy, go in peace. May the living Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forevermore. Amen.